Welcome to this graduation week and our first event, the Preaching Marathon finalists. We're delighted that you're here and looking forward to hearing these five young men preach this morning. I believe that you'll be helped and challenged by their messages and uh, we're praying to that end at least. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll give just a few instructions as to how the morning will go and, and uh, get right into it this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful new morning you've given to us to enjoy and to be here at West Coast Baptist College. Thank you for our guests, our family members and friends that have come in to join us. And we pray now in this uh, first service, so to speak, of this week, that Lord, you'll anoint the preaching of your word. Thank you that uh, these young men have answered the call to preach. And Lord, now you've placed this message for this hour in their heart and life. And I pray as an audience, we'll be uh, willing to listen and also to allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to us. And we'll pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we'll have five preachers come and preach. They'll preach in this order, uh, Samuel Jackson, Gil Edmondson, Justin Lenore, Daniel Cannon, and Joe Magsino. We'll have one verse of a song between each one of them to give you a chance to, to stand for a moment and stretch a little bit. We would ask you once the preachers begin not to move about or go in and out uh, so they can keep their concentration as they preach. And uh, so we're delighted uh, for these young men. Uh, we had a number of men preach in the preliminary round and then again in the semifinal round. If you participated in the preaching marathon, would you stand at this time? All the young men that preached earlier, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you guys, appreciate that. You can be seated as well as the girls who just walked in late and took all that applause from them. But uh, we don't let any girls preach around here, at least not from the pulpit. I was preaching for a friend of mine years ago and, and he was uh, letting his church know they were having a ladies conference and he said, now my wife will be preaching at the ladies conference. And he said, you ladies need to come. She's a great preacher. He said, I've made most of my best decisions under her preaching. And so uh, women do preach, just not from the pulpit. So uh, we're thankful for them too. But we're delighted you're here. At this time, I'm going to ask Samuel to come and give us our first message today. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. It's my book, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. I hope you have a copy of the scriptures uh, this morning. Um, growing up, my mom would always tell me, Sam, if you're ever looking for um, answers to questions in life, whether you go into ministry or whether you, you go to West Coast Baptist College, know that it's all found in the Word of God. And I'm so thankful for God's Word, and I'm thankful that I get to share to the student body what the Lord has taught me. So from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. We see in this story a man named Saul, a man who was appointed king by God's judge Samuel. As Samuel came to the throne, so many people were excited to see him bring victory to the land, to conquer the enemy. There was no question, there was no doubt that a lot of people saw potential within this young man's life. As we're here at West Coast Baptist College, we find ourselves in the same position that Saul was in. You see, all of us, as we're here training as laborers for the harvest, so many people are excited to see what we're going to do. Faculty and staff, our friends, even, even people back home are so excited to see what God is going to do. Even through our teaching, our preaching, even when we go soul winning, it's exciting to see what God is going to do through each and every one of our lives. And as everybody looks at your life, as everybody looks at my life, they get excited because they see the potential that lies within our lives. But if we're not careful, we could eventually come to the same place where Saul came to. See, in this story, God commands Saul to utterly destroy all of the Amalekites and everything that they have. But as we continue reading this passage, we see that Saul allows one thing to creep into his life, one thing to creep into his life that eventually destroyed him and destroyed his reign as well. Saul allowed pride to creep into his life. And because of pride, he lost touch with God. You see, pride is when we find satisfaction and joy in our own selves, in our own achievements, and in our own goals as well. See, and if we come to a place where we find our satisfaction in ourselves, when we come to a place where we allow pride to creep into our lives, we can come to a place where we destroy our own lives. We can come to a place where we lose touch with God. 
So for a few moments tonight, we're going to take a look at the life of King Saul and see the three dangers, the three dangers of pride from a life of King Saul that we all must be aware of. The first danger of pride that was found within Saul's life was the danger of blaming others. The danger of blaming others. In verse 15, Saul said, They have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. We see in verse 21 that Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. But in verse 21, we see him say, But the people took the spoil of the sheep and the oxen. In the end of verse 24, we see him also say, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You see, over and over again, we see Saul blaming people all around him. But keep in mind that he's a king. Keep in mind that he's a leader. But over and over again, all he sees is the problem of the people. As we look at the condition of America, see the social and the political problems that we see. We also see drugs, alcohol, crime that, that's rampant throughout our country. Even as we walk around campus, we see the need for revival. We see that there's spiritual apathy there. But how often do we look at the staff? How often do we look at our roommates? How often do we look at someone back home and say, if they were just to get right with the Lord, we would have revival. Hey, if they were just to pray, we would have revival. Hey, if they were just to read their Bible more, we would have revival. But may I remind you today that it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You see, revival doesn't start with blaming, all, blaming everybody around us. You see, revival starts in me. Revival starts in you. I think about the reaction disciples had when Jesus washed their feet before he went to Calvary. He said, one of you will betray me tonight. You see, their response was, is it John, Lord? Is it Mark, Lord? Is it Thomas, Lord? He's been doubting you. Is it, is it Judas, Lord? He looks pretty suspicious. No, their response was, is it me, Lord? I think about Isaiah when, when he saw God high and lifted up, and he said, woe is me, for I am undone. You see, revival comes when you realize it must start with you. Will you beware of the danger of blaming other people around you? But also, will you beware of the danger of being blinded to sin? We see in verse 3 that God tells Saul, hey, utterly destroy all the Amalekites and everything that they have. So then a few verses later, Samuel comes by and see how Saul's doing. But then Samuel says to Saul, what is the bleeding of the sheep and oxen that I hear? Why is King Agag still alive? And we see Saul's reaction in verse 20. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You see, Saul was blinded to his own sin. Saul wasn't willing to open his eyes to his sin. I just think about being back home and, and always have this problem of not being able to find things in the fridge. Probably most of you have that problem too. So I would try to look for milk or eggs. I, I would get so frustrated. And when I can't find it, I would yell over to my mom and say, Mom, can you please, where, where is the eggs? I don't know where they're at. She'd say, it's right in front of you, Sam. Can't you see it? I thought to myself, it just magically appeared out of nowhere. I, I looked there. I, I, I knew, I knew I looked there. And a few moments later, I, I look into the fridge again, fridge again to, to find some milk. But then I realize it's not there, so I'm like, again, Mom, where is the milk? And my mom comes over and says, Sam, it's right in front of you. Are you blind? Can't you see it? It's right here. But how often does God come to us and say, say hey, do you see the anger, the sin of anger right in front of you? Do you see the sin, sin of bitterness right in front of you? Hey, do you see the sin of cheating on a test right in front of you that you never confessed to a teacher? Do you see the sin of lust that you see right in front of you that you never brought to the light? Hey, do you see the sin of blaming other people around you? You see, God's not looking for someone that's perfect, but God is looking for someone that's honest. You see, in order to be used by God this summer, in order to be used in the ministry, whether you're doing Jewish this summer, whether you're doing neighborhood Bible time, whether you're interning, whether you're going out to the ministry, graduating senior. You see, in order to be used by God, you, ha you can't hide in dark places, but you have to come willingly to the light and confess your sin. See, Saul was blinded to his sin. Saul was blaming other people around him, but lastly, Saul believed the lie. We see in verse 17, Samuel said to Saul, Hey, when thou was little in thine own sight. When thou was little in thine own sight. Hey, remember Saul the time when, when you were little in your own sight? Hey, remember Saul the time when, when you first became king, you were little in your own sight? So oftentimes when, I, when I'm here at West Coast, I, 
often find myself saying, Sam, just look at you. You're, you go to West Coast Baptist College. Hey, look at you. You're, you're a Blue Crew supervisor. Hey, look at you. You're a system dorm supervisor. Hey, look at you. You have a girlfriend. You got your bill paid off. You have all together. But then last time I remember, the same church that God said he would spew out of his mouth, the Laodicean church said the same thing. For I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You see, when we come to a place where we start believing in a lie, we start thinking that we're something, just like King Saul thought he was something. You see, when we come to that point, God can't use us. But then I think about the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, where the Apostle Paul said, not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You see, you might say to yourself, well, I'm a nobody. You might say to yourself, well, I have nothing. You might say, say to yourself, well, I'm from nowhere. But that's who God delights to use. See, God delights to use nobodies from nowhere with nothing. See, that's what he's looking for. Just consider Jesus Christ, who made himself of no reputation and took upon himself a form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Just think about Jesus Christ, who being God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He went to the cross to save you. He humbled himself to die on a cross, to be buried and to rise again, but it started out with humbling himself. Will you humble yourself? Because he humbled himself for you. As you go out throughout the summer, as you're here at West Coast, as you go to ministry, will you beware of the dangers of pride? The danger of blaming other people, the danger of, of being blinded to sin, and the danger of believing that you're something when you're really nothing. And will you consider Christ continually throughout the summer? Consider Christ. For he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in yet another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held a public office. He never had a family of his own. He never owned a home. He never went to college. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. You see, he did none of those things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. You see, his friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And he was laid in a borrowed grave through the kindness of a friend. Over 20 centuries have come and gone. Today, he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, all the great things of this world put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. You see, if Jesus Christ humbled himself for you, will you humble yourself for him? If you see the dangers of pride within your own life, would you be willing today to say, God, start the work in me. Lord, start the work in me. Would you come to a place where you confess your sin and realize, Lord, I have sin in my life. I'll confess it. And when you lastly come to a place where you obey him, not for your glory and honor, but for his. Thank you. Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood. Of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, 
my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Amen. Be seated. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 14, and then we're going to jump down to verse 20. This is Paul speaking in verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Jump down to verse 20. This is still Paul speaking. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The letter of Galatians was written to the churches of Galatia because they forgot the simplicity of the gospel. And that is the same exact issue facing Peter in this passage. They forgot the gospel. They forgot their identity. The world has everyone convinced that the key to a satisfied life is that journey of finding out who you are. When Christ died to tell you to give up the search, because he already found you. When I was, uh, a few years ago when I was still living at home, um, I have a, a couple siblings and my youngest sibling is my sister, my only sister. Uh, there's about 12 years difference between me and her. And uh, she trusted me because I was her older brother. And that was her first mistake. Um, one day she was being annoying or I was bored. Probably both. I don't really remember. But I decided I was going to do something about it. Well, I found one of my younger siblings' jacket, a pullover, and I put it over her with her arms by her side, where the arms were out. And she thought that was fun. She was just flailing around and she was having a good time. And then I took her into her own room and I took the sleeves of that jacket and tied them behind her back to her bedpost for no reason. <laughs> After that, I pulled out my phone, took a few pictures, and left. Very shortly thereafter, the whole house knew something happened to Katie because she started screaming at the top of her lungs, Mom, Mom, Mom! My mom found me very shortly thereafter, and she only had one question for me. Who do you think you are? How am I supposed to answer that? I'm Gil, your firstborn son. <laughs> Duh. Not the answer she was looking for. You see, she wasn't just asking me, who was I? She was asking me, why did you think that was okay? You know better than this. Why did you do that? Who do you think you are? That's the exact same question that Paul posed to Peter in this passage. And that's the exact same question that God's word poses to us today. Who do you think you are? We're going to look at three keys to rediscovering your forgotten identity. First of all, look with me in verse 11. We're going to look at the consequences of a forgotten identity. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did it with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. The first consequence of a forgotten identity is the fear of man. There was only one factor motivating Peter in this passage to do what he did, and that's because he was afraid of the Jews. He was being motivated purely by what, what others thought of him. The second consequence of a forgotten identity is a failing mission. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly why it is that Peter went to Antioch. But I can assure you it wasn't to cause division in the church. Peter wasn't sitting in Jerusalem saying, all right, let's go make a mess in Antioch. Failing mission. Peter was an apostle. He was called to establish the church. He was called to preach the gospel. And he was doing none of that because he forgot. 
Who do you think you are? Look in verse 14. We're going to look at the cause of a forgotten identity. But when I saw, do not miss this, that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That we, me and you, Peter, us Jews, we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Peter forgot what he was free from. Judaism. You see, it was more than just a belief, more than just a race, more than just a people group. Judaism was their entire life. It affected what they wore. It affected what they ate. It affected where they went. They built their entire calendar around the feast of Judaism. Judaism was a system of trying to please God by what I can do for him, seeking justification by works. But Peter was free from that. Peter was free from trying to please God on his own way. He was free from trying to get God's favor by what he could do, and he forgot. Not only did he forget what he was free from, he forgot who he was free for. Peter wasn't free for himself. He was free for Jesus. When Jesus called him to be one of the 12, it wasn't because he was impressed with Peter's fishing ability. It wasn't because of what Peter could do for him. It was because he wanted to invest in Peter. He wanted to teach Peter, and he wanted to send Peter out for his own cause, for Jesus Christ's cause. That's why he calls us. It's not for us. It's for him. He forgot what he was free from, and he forgot who he was free for. Thirdly, and lastly, we're going to look at the correction of a forgotten identity. Look in verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Remember Christ's sacrifice. I am crucified with Christ. That cat of nine tails that tore Jesus' back into ribbons of flesh when he was so marred that you couldn't even tell he was a man, that's what happened to my identity. When they nailed Jesus to that cross, they put me there with him. When they took him down and buried him in the grave, my identity was buried. And when he raised again, he left it there. Remember Christ's sacrifice. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Remember your salvation. You see, the reason this is a forgotten identity is every Christian understands it. Every single Christian who's been saved, who's been justified by faith, recognizes that it's 100% God and 0% me. Amen. For the wages of sin is death. That's me. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is none righteous. No, not one. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person who's saved recognizes the truth that it's not about me, it's all about Christ. It's not about what I can do for myself, it's all about what Christ did for me. The problem is that since the foundation of the church, we forget. Who do you think you are? You're not a West Coast student. Who do you think you are? It's not about your summer internship. Who do you think you are? It's not about Jewish outreach. Who do you think you are? It's not even about having a position in a church. It's about Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. You are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, yet not you, but Christ liveth. In you. You are nothing but a Christian because Christ is everything. Amen. 
Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children in His arms. Carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Be seated. If you have your Bibles today, turn them to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 and verse number 32. The Bible says this. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Unfulfilled expectations always result in inevitable disappointment. My dad is one of the greatest heroes in my life. He served 27 years as a senior chief in the Navy, but to be honest with you, growing up, it wasn't always easy. He was oftentimes, de he was oftentimes deployed during my childhood, eight months out of the year, and I would miss him terribly. But one cool thing that my dad would do for me and my brother, every single time he would go on deployment or he would leave for a trip, he would always ask us for a list. And on this list, we could put anything that we wanted. It could be the newest toy, the newest gadgets, uh, whatever we wanted to put on that list, we would write it down and we would give it to him. And when, while he was overseas, he was able to try and find that for us. And when he came back, the stuff that we wanted would also come back with him. I remember one year, I was seven years old, and I'd asked my dad that year for one thing and one thing only. And that was a brand new action figure set. And I was pumped for this. I was super excited. I remember bugging my dad before, I, before he had gone on deployment. Dad, can you please get me this action figure set? I remember while he was on deployment, I would email him month after month and ask him, Dad, did you, did you, were you able to find this action figure set? And I remember him replying back and saying, no, I haven't found it yet. Eight months came and passed, and my dad was finally coming home. And I was excited. But to be honest with you, as a seven-year-old kid, I was probably more excited that I was about to get a new toy. So I remember rushing home that day after school and digging through all the luggage, looking for that brand new action figure set, and I couldn't find it. Because that day, instead of getting an action figure set, I got clothes. And clothes are the worst gift that you could ever get a kid. And I was disappointed. In this passage of scripture, Mary and Martha find themselves in the same position. They have a problem that they can't fix. A problem or a situation that they can't see through. Their brother Lazarus is sick unto death, so they go to the one person they knew who could fix their problem. They go to Jesus and they call for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. And they created this expectation that Jesus was going to come by and that he was going to heal Lazarus and Lazarus wouldn't have died. Days came and went and no doubt they were waiting for Jesus to arrive and, and to come onto the scene and be able to heal Lazarus, but he never showed up. And now Lazarus is dead. And their disappointment has caused them to doubt. What disappointment in your life has caused you to doubt God? In this passage of scripture, we notice two questions that disappointment creates. The first is a question of God's presence. In verse number 32, the Bible says this, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Mary was saying, Jesus, if you were here, Lazarus wouldn't be dead. If you were here, I wouldn't be in this situation. And oftentimes we question God's presence and we look to God and we say, God, if you were here, I wouldn't be in this mess. If you were here for me, I wouldn't be in this situation. God, where were you? 
Where were you when my parents were getting a divorce? Where were you when my dad had cancer? Where were you when I felt so alone and there was no one there for me? God, where were you? And we mistake God's stillness for silence. But notice that our Savior is constantly aware. In verse number 33, the Bible says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You see, Mary, she probably felt like she was all alone, that Jesus was not there for her, and she probably felt like Jesus could have done something in that situation, but he was absent. But can I tell you that Jesus, there was never a moment where Jesus did not know what was going on. And Jesus saw her in her pain and in her disappointment. And friend, can I remind you today that you may be discouraged, you may be disappointed, you may feel like no one's there for you, you may have cried tears behind closed doors, but can I remind you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He sees you. Amen. And not only does He see you, the Bible says that Jesus groaned in the Spirit. He not only sees you, but He feels what you feel. He feels that pain. He relates to your pain. The Bible reminds us of this in Hebrews chapter 4. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points such as we are, yet without sin. He sees you and he feels what you feel because he is constantly aware and he is actively concerned. In verse number 34, the Bible says, Where have ye laid him? Mary was feeling all alone, feeling like Jesus was not there for her. But when Jesus, got to the, when Jesus got to the place where she was at, she said, where have ye laid him? You know what Jesus was saying there? Jesus was saying, bring me to your problem. And God calls you in your disappointment, in your discouragement, and in your unmet expectations. He's calling you to bring him to your problem. Why? Because he cares for you. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Our Savior is constantly aware and he is always concerned. There's a question of God's presence, but also a question of God's power. In verse number 37, the Bible says this. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died. The Jews were saying, hey, if Jesus was able to heal the blind man, why wasn't he able to heal Lazarus? And oftentimes, you and I, we can get into a position, we start comparing our lives to others, and we say, God, if you're doing this in their life, why can't you do that in mine? God, if you fix their problems, why can't you fix my problem? God, who are you? Are you really that powerful? Can you really fix my situation? Can you really fix my disappointment? And we've mistaken God's inactivity for inability. But notice that our Savior is a faithful champion. In verse number 43, the Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Fourth, you see, Mary and Martha and the Jews, they may have felt that, that there was nothing that Jesus could have done in their situation. There was nothing that Jesus could have done to fix their problem. But all Jesus had to do was say, Lazarus, come forth, and their situation was fixed. And friend, expectations can fail you. Your plans can fail you. Your hopes and your dreams, they can fail you. But I can promise you that Jesus will never fail you. And I'm glad that I serve a God whose ways are higher than my ways and whose thoughts are higher than my thoughts and whose plans are better than my plans and whose dreams are greater than my dreams. He's wonderful. He's powerful. He's indescribable. He's in uncontainable. And if the same God that split the seas and if the same God that spoke the stars into existence and if the same God that defeated death for you and me is for you, what can stand against you? He's a faithful champion. But this faithful champion also has a fruitful cause. In verse number four, the Bible says this. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, 
that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Mary and Martha were no doubt questioning why they had to experience this pain and experience this disappointment in their life. And maybe you're in here today questioning God and saying, God, why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to face this disappointment? The reason why is because that day, Mary and Martha got a first-hand glimpse of God's glory. And you see, your sorrow and your disappointment makes way for God's glory because your trial, it was never about you. It was always about Him. And in your disappointment, you get the awesome opportunity to see God for who He really is. And you get to see firsthand His glory because He is good in spite of your circumstance. Has your disappointment caused you to question God's presence And God's power? You know, the only way to avoid disappointment is to adjust our expectations. As I got older and my dad would go on more and more deployments, I began to realize that the stuff that I got from him wasn't that important. Because what was important to me as I got older was that my dad got home. You see, I just wanted my dad to come home. And the truth is, it wasn't about what I got, it was about who I got. In your trial, in your disappointment, it's not about what you have in your life, it's about who you have in your life. The psalmist said it best in Psalm 62 verse 5, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Because when you place your expectations on a situation, they will always leave you empty. But when you place your expectations and your hopes and your plans and your dreams in the Savior, they will always be exceeded. Has disappointment caused you to question God's power? Where are you placing your expectations? Are they on your situation? Or are they on the Savior? Praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. I'm excited to call your attention to this passage this morning. I hope you're ready to hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 42. Beginning in verse 5, Isaiah 42, 5 says, Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. Look at verse 6. This is a very interesting verse because it is God the Father speaking prophetically, talking directly to his son, Jesus Christ. It's so fascinating to me. Look at verse 6. I, the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Wow. What a message from the Father. Imagine the prophet Isaiah as he received this message from God. Imagine as he thought forward to the Messiah. Oh, what an amazing Messiah this will be. What a message from the Father to the Son. But let's, let's fast forward. Let's fast forward a couple hundred years. Let's leave Isaiah and let's come forward to A.D. 30-ish. 
Jesus Christ is about 33 years old. He's being tortured. His body is a bloody pulp. His skin is stretched out. He, his body hurts so bad from the whipping that he can barely feel the thorns that are in his head. The stone and the glass is digging into his flesh and ripping it off in chunks as the Romans mercilessly beat his body. And maybe, maybe in the midst of that torture, he thought back. He had a flashback to the sweet years of silence before the preaching, before the torture, before the pain. Maybe at the end of a, a long day of work, he sat down on his bed and he would read the scripture. Now put, put yourself here. Imagine as Jesus Christ read Isaiah chapter 42. <laughs> Directly from his father, he read, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness <laughs> and will hold thine hand and will keep thee. <sighs> what a comforting message from his father. Can you imagine? Directly from the father. But then Jesus Christ is ripped back onto his feet and his head is throbbing. He can, he can barely see anything because his eyes are so covered with blood. He can barely stay awake. <laughs> he wonders why. Why? Why should I go through this? Why should I let these men beat me? Why should I finish this? Those words probably came to his head. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. He wondered why. He said, I've called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I can see Jesus right there. He probably stood up with some strength. And he goes to the place where he has to take up his cross. And it hurts so bad. And his body is in pain. He's writhing. But God says, no, I've got to use you to open the blind eyes. God, why should I finish this? Finish it for Daniel Cannon. Finish it for John Getch. Finish it for Paul Chapel. You've got to do this because they're blind. And if you don't finish this, if I don't finish this, they'll stay blind. If I don't finish this, they'll stay in prison. No one will free them. I have to finish this for them. Jesus Christ finished for you. Will you finish for him? Jesus Christ said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Listen, friend, the pathway to the cross, it's not a comfortable journey. But he had a comforting message from his father that I'm sure kept him going. And now you may say, no, Daniel, this, this, is, this is Jesus being crucified you're talking about. We're not going to go through this. No, this is... This is 2,000 years ago, there was a horrible, tyrannical government in place. They wouldn't have tortured someone like that today. But listen, the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Pause. Say amen if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus. Amen. You ready for a promise from God? All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They don't usually put that one in a promises book. Friend, when your persecution comes, I didn't say if, when your persecution comes, let me ask, what will keep you going? You may say, no, I've had a comfortable life up till now. I'm in Bible college. My parents fully support my decisions. I have a wonderful home. I have a wonderful fiance. I have a wonderful base of friends here. I have a great Christian life. When I go home, my church is so supportive of me. I, Everyone is so proud of me. I have a great Christian life. What are you talking about persecution? No, the persecution is coming. When it comes, what is going to keep you from quitting on God? And I'm not talking about persecution like my friend called me stupid. No, I'm talking about when your close circle of friends, the people you cling to, the people you need, what happens when they call you a heretic for clinging to the King James Bible? What then? What happens, Brother Johnston, when you're 10 years down the road and your family is pulled from you because you said from the pulpit that parents, you should spank your kids? What happens when you are pulled, Kevin Labra, 
to prison in India for preaching the gospel to lost children? What happens then? When you are beat in a prison for the cause of Christ, what will keep you from quitting? I'm not talking about light persecution. I'm talking about a great trial of affliction when it comes. How long are you going to be comfortable in America? You don't know. There is only a moment between you and the persecution that God has promised. I'm talking about when you're down on your knees and (laughs) you don't know why you're going to keep going. God, why should I go through this? Why should I finish this? He'll say, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Listen, and will hold thine hand. (laughs) No, God, God, I I want my family. I want to keep my comfort. I, I have great respect in the Baptist realm. God, I don't want to lose my respect. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to suffer persecution. He says, no. I will keep thee. God, I don't want to lose my family. And he says, no, you cannot quit because I have souls for you. He says, I want to use you to bring some people out of prison. I want to use you to open some blind eyes. There are souls this summer that need you to be faithful to the call of God because if you quit, who's going to bring them out of prison? Who's going to open their blind eyes? Don't you quit on God's calling in your life. You cannot quit on the call that God has placed in your life. And you say, no, I'm not called of God. The Bible says, he that hath my word. Raise your hand if you have the word of God. It says, he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Are you going to quit on God's call in your life? What's going to keep you going when that trial comes? And I want to comment This is so important. Jesus Christ had a message directly from the Father in Isaiah 42. You have a message directly from the Father. The Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now listen, this message of comfort that kept Jesus Christ from quitting, it didn't come on the path to the cross. The message that God wants to give you to keep you from quitting when your persecution comes... It's not going to come in the persecution. No, it has to be in you beforehand. It will come in quiet. It will come in solitude when you're spending time with the Lord. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. He that is of God heareth his words. Did you hear God's words this morning? Maybe this morning in your devotional time with the Lord, he gave you the passage that's going to keep you going when your persecution comes. But listen, did you miss it? Are you going to miss it your first day home this summer? Parents, your children need you to have the word of the Lord in you. Do you have a message from the Father that's going to keep you going? Listen to this song. This message It's absolutely amazing. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee. Why? Jesus Christ, he was going to give him a covenant of the people, a light of the Gentiles. Why? To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now think of that message. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, to know, thus saith the Lord. Think of that last verse. Based on this passage, think of that last verse. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. You have a message from the Father this morning. Will you take it with you for when your persecution comes? Amen. Amen. You're doing great. Standing, let's stand again. Please. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Summer is...
is here. Can I get an amen? amen. I think we could do a little better than that. Let's try it again. Summer is here. Amen. Where's my seniors at? Let's go. Uh, a couple days. And uh, I'm thankful for this place. And uh, if, you, if you believe that the best is yet to come, would you say amen? amen. You know, but if I can encourage you with this, the best is today. And, uh, and don't miss out what God has for you. Um, this morning, I, I want to charge you uh, with this. We must preach the gospel. Let me say that one last time. We must preach the gospel. Would you look at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're thankful that God has given you that promise, would you say amen? amen. But look at the dilemma that he gives us in verse 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. There was one desire that consumed the Apostle Paul. That desire was that his generation would know Jesus as Savior. In fact, he said that my desire and heart's prayer is that Israel might be saved. He said that his burden for his generation was a continual heaviness that weighed upon his heart. I wonder this morning, is that your burden? Do you want your generation to know Jesus as Savior? But you see... Paul wasn't just stirred about the need of his generation, but he was compelled to do something about the need of his generation. You see, I love what the pioneer uh, missionary David Livingston once said, sympathy is no substitute for action. You see, Paul didn't just see his generation, he didn't just see the need of his generation and was stirred. He wasn't just burdened, but he was compelled to preach the gospel to his generation. No wonder why the Apostle Paul said that there was a necessity that was laid upon me. For woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And may I declare to you this morning that you and I are living in the last days. Guys, time is short. And the hope of our generation is the gospel. Amen. Let me say that again. The hope for our generation, West Coast Baptist College, is the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, the murder, the burial, and praise God on the third day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But why was it that Paul was so stirred? And why was it that Paul was so passionate about preaching the gospel? Well, here in Romans chapter 10, he tells you and I exactly why he needed to preach the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen, Time is short. You need to preach the gospel. Why must we preach the gospel? Well, first of all, would you look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why must we preach the gospel? Because of what Jesus has done for us. Just for a moment this morning, would you remember the days that you didn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Just for a moment this morning, remember when you're shackled to your sin. Just for a moment this morning, remember, remember the days that you were a slave to sin. There was no hope for you. You were hopeless. Do you remember the days that you attempted to fulfill the deepest cravings of your heart, but you always found yourself empty? Do you remember the days of your life where you were committed to trying to be righteous, to trying to be good enough? But you always found yourself guilty. How about this? Do you remember the days, because of your life, you were headed for destruction? You were in a pit that you could not get yourself out of. How about this? 
Remember, because of your sins, you are on your way to hell. Hopeless. A place without Jesus. A place of gnashing of teeth. A place of eternal fire. A place where God cannot be found. A place with no exit. But do you remember that day when somebody told you about Jesus? And how he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. Do you remember that moment when somebody told you that Jesus was murdered for you? Do you remember that moment when somebody told you that Jesus was so beaten to the pulp that you could not recognize who he was? Do you remember that moment when somebody told you that he, that he, he took a crown of thorns and it was platted upon his head? Do you remember that moment when someone first told you that he took the cat of nine tails and he was whipped upon his back? Do you remember that first time that somebody told you that he took three nails and he was nailed at his feet and his hands? Do you remember that first time that somebody told you that if you were to just place your faith and trust in Christ, that you can be saved? Do you remember that first time that somebody told you, hey, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? And remember that moment in your life when you decided, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to turn to my religiousness. Hey, I'm not going to try to be a good person. But remember that moment when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and he saved you. Would, if you're thankful for that which, this morning, would you say amen? And man, those shackles of sin that you were bound to, you were freed from. Man, he gave you a new life. He gave you abundant life. He gave you a new home. And ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we must preach the gospel is because of what Jesus has done for us. Do you remember the story of the Apostle Paul? Man, he was the chiefest of sinners. He was shackled to his sin. But remember, as he was taking his journey, how he had a personal encounter with God. And at that moment, we find the miraculous moment when Saul was converted to Paul. And the persecutor of the Christian is now the preacher. And the word of God tells us that straight away, he had to go tell somebody. And you see, Paul could not restrain what God did for him. He could not keep it to himself that he had been saved. No wonder why he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to everyone that believeth. And ladies and gentlemen, we must preach the gospel because of what Jesus has done for us. And maybe this morning, if we were to be honest with ourselves, maybe we've gotten a little cold. Maybe we've become, we've become a little apathetic. Let me encourage you. Before you leave this auditorium, ask God to stir you about that moment when you received him again. We live in the last days. This world needs to hear about Jesus. Why do we preach, ladies and gentlemen? Because of what Jesus has done for us. I wonder, have you gotten over the fact that Jesus was murdered for you? But lastly this morning, the reason why we must preach the gospel is because there's a whole world that still needs to hear. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But God says this. How are they going to get saved unless they believe? And how are they going to believe unless somebody tells them? There's 7.6 billion people on this world. While you and I are waiting for the second coming of Christ, there are billions that have not even heard that he came the first time. Places in Africa, places in India, Kevin, places even in the Philippines, places even here in Lancaster and Palmdale where boys and girls have never even heard of Jesus Christ. God has not called us to be watchers of aquariums. He's called, to be, he's called us to be fishers of men. Aren't you thankful that Jesus loves you? Aren't you thankful that Jesus saved you? But realize this this morning. Just as Jesus loved you and died for you, Jesus loves and died for the 7.6 billion people of this world. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know what, Joe, I'm not called to be a preacher. I'm not called to be a missionary. I love what the pioneer missionary to the Philippines once said, Bob Hughes, why do you need a call when you have a command? Why do you need a voice when you have a verse? Why must we preach the gospel? 
because there's a whole world that still needs to hear. I think so often times, Artie, we get caught up in our Christian bubble. And we're busy about serving God. We get caught up in this bubble of Bible college. You know, we're busy trying to get our degree. But we forget that there's a whole world that still needs to hear. And you and I have the hope, and that's the gospel. So why do we preach the gospel? Why do we need to preach the gospel? Because of what Jesus has done for us. But lastly, because there's a whole world that needs to hear. We must preach the gospel. On the dresser in my room, I carry with me, I, I have a, a, a candle. I know the girls collect the candles, amen? This one's not a scented one, though, okay? Um, the, the candle is a reminder to me that regardless of how dark a room is, that the slightest bit of light makes all the difference. Ye are the light of the world. Hey, let's stop criticizing and let's stop talking about how this world needs a revival and let's just let our light shine. But the candle is also a reminder to Joe of the brevity of its, of its life. You see, if I were to light this candle, it'll burn for a couple hours and it's gone. Your life is short. Let that sink in because it's, it's, it's a reality. Your life is short. Your life is short. Their lives are short. Who's going to tell them about Jesus? We must preach the gospel. If you believe God's called you to be a preacher, a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, would you please stand to your feet? Man, that's awesome. Can I charge you this morning? Preach the gospel. Can I encourage you this morning? Preach the gospel. Preach as a dying man to dying men. Let your light shine. If you believe that God's called you to be an educator, to one day teach children and young people, would you please stand to your feet? Preach the gospel. Please. Your generation needs you. If you believe that God's called you to be a musician, to write godly music, would you please stand to your feet? Hey, Josh, preach the gospel, man. Hey, how about this? If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you've had a personal encounter with God, you know you're on your way to heaven, would you please stand to your feet? God is pleading with you this morning. Please preach the gospel. You can be seated. For now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Ladies and gentlemen, time is short. Let your light shine. If you're seated here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if I could plead with you, please don't go to hell. Jesus loves you so much that he was murdered for you. And on the third day he rose again. And he says that whosoever shall call upon him, the Lord, shall be saved. Please don't leave this week without making that decision. That's the greatest decision that you could ever make. And West Coast Baptist College students, you are the hope. We, we've got to let our, our light shine. The hour is late. We must preach the gospel. If you would close your eyes and bow your heads, would you allow God to stir you with whatever he's spoken to you about this morning? God, thank you so much for this day. And Lord, thank you so much. Like, I feel like this morning you've just reminded us of, God, how much you love us and how you demonstrated that. And God, I pray that you would, not help, you would help us to not get over the fact that you saved us. And God, if there is somebody here that doesn't know, know you as their Savior, Lord, would you help them to make that decision? But God, if we've made that decision, Lord, would you stir us about the need of our generation? And would you use us for your glory and for your honor? In your son's name we pray. Amen.